So we are very happy indeed to start this first training at ABD. I don't know if some of the people who are here, you have already participated in the training session done by uh, Paiochi project partners last week. Well, I just want to tell you that the training sessions we have started in February, which will continue in March, well, we are holding them within the framework of the LILA project. And the idea of this training session is precisely to create a dialogue and exchange platform for good practices between professionals who work with women and with girls who are the victims of male chauvinistic violence and the idea is to create an exchange and to be able to offer you tools in order to increase our capabilities and our daily work to start well this training session will be held in spanish but we have two interpreters who will be interpreting into english so if you click if you go to the bottom part of your screen there is a globe and here you can select either english or spanish okay i'm going to well i hope you have understood next what i've said in english if you have any queries especially well you can write it down during the session which will last till half past 12 in the chat Icon and our colleague Carlota will manage those Q and A's. Now, other housekeeping affairs at eleven fifteen when Maite has finished the training, we'll have a fifteen minute uh, break and then we will start again with the training. And finally, once it's over, we will send you to your email an assessment questionnaire. It will last for a few minutes, but please complete it because it's going to be very useful for us to be able to improve and to carry out the assessment of this training session and finally another detail if you want the an attendance certificate we'll send you the details by mail but you must send us an email at international or at R -A -G. And please send it today, because if not, we will be sending, we'll be receiving emails throughout many weeks, and we do not know what workshop is all about. Let me introduce Maite. She's our speaker today. Her name is Maite Strack Roger. She is a lawyer specializing in families and gender differences. She's a lawyer with more than 25 years of experience and with a master's degree in family and childhood law. She is a lawyer in CIE since 2012, and you will be able to get to know the people in our territory horsey and she was also a, a, a lawyer in Prada Lubrugat in C until October 2021 and finally she also acted as a substitute judge from 2009 till 2013 and today she will train us and I hope you'll enjoy it and that's it I'm going to give now the floor to my colleague Maite well thank you Mireya well good morning everybody I hope I'm going to, to make you, I, I, I hope my presentation will interest you. It's going to be quite, but it's going to be useful to get to know our model in Catalonia. And I'm going to divide it up into three parts. The first part is the reform about the law on gender violence, 5 bar 2008, which has been reformed in 17 bar 2020. We will talk about the concepts and the reforms that this law has been subjected to. Then we will talk about the protocol prepared and developed by this law. And the third part will be about the network of violence, how we work in our territory with regards to all of the services involved in taking care of women and children who are the victims of gender violence. Okay, so we'll talk about the framework 
and the specialized care service model and the approach of gender-based violence in Catalonia. So let me start with the law. The main novelties of Law 17 bar 2020, which changes the law of women to eradicate male violence, which was changed with the ratification of the Istanbul Convention, which Spain ratified in 2014. And this generated the amendment of the Catalonian law in 2008, which has been carried out through this notice of Law 17 bar 2020. Next. Let's start with the definition of gender-based violence, male chauvinistic violence, which has been expanded thanks to the ratification of the Istanbul Convention. When we talk about male chauvinistic violence, we talk about the violation of human rights through the violence exercised against women as an expression of the discrimination and the situation of inequality in the framework of the relation system of power of men over women, which produced through physical, economic, financial or psychological means, including threats, intimidations, and uh, coercion. It has, as a result, a physical lesion, sexual or psychological, both in the public and private field. The definition collected in the amendment of this law with regards to previous phases, it's important to highlight the fact that it's recognized as a violation of human rights. And in front of other legislations in Spain that are I mean, because Catalonia is a, an autonomous region and there are different legislations within Spain faced with gender violence. In terms of male chauvinistic violence in Catalonia, in addition to it being recognized as a violation of human rights, it is recognized that its gender-based violence can, be, can occur in the private or the public realm. We also talk about new definitions. We expand the definitions. When we talk about women in this reform, now we also include girls and teenagers. And therefore, we talk about girls, young women, and transgender teenagers, all of those who live and work in Catalonia, and also their sons and daughters. As defined in the Istanbul Convention, and as I've mentioned beforehand, gender-based violence, it is a violation of human rights. And with regards to this, I'm going to repeat this because it is very important. Another new concept that I shall develop later when we talk about the protocol that develops this law is the secondary victimization or re-victimization which is the, Ill treat the additional ill treatment exercised against women who find themselves in gender-based violence and their sons and daughters as a direct or indirect consequence of the quantitative and qualitative deficits of the interventions carried out by the authorities and also by the actions the negligence coming from the, the agents involved in these actions. And this primary and secondary victimization will also be discussed in my presentation. All of the measures and the recognition of this right, which this law points out to, must respect gender diversity. And for this reason, when we talk about women, transgender women who do not have their gender recorded as a woman in their official documents are equal to the other women who have suffered gender-led violence to the extent that, as we have said in the definition, they are recognized as women. There is a partial change of different concepts. For example, when we talk about awareness raising, we include educational measures. When we talk about the recovery processes, we introduce what we call the de-victimization process in all of the fields affected, carried out by the women themselves and by their sons and daughters. And this process implies a whole personal life cycle and a whole social life cycle for the woman focused on re-establishing all of the fields that have been damaged because of the 
gender-based violence they have experienced. When we talk about repair, we talk about the, a number of legal, financial, social, work, health, educational measures undertaken by all of the bodies and responsible agents for the intervention in this gender-based violence, which contributes to the reestablishing of all of the fields damaged by the experience, guaranteeing at all times an accompaniment in this repair and the needed advice. There are new definitions of what we call due diligence, and this will also be expanded when we talk about the protocol. What is due diligence? It is the duty of public powers to prevent, investigate, persecute, punish, and repair gender violence acts and to protect the victims. That means that there is the duty to act proactively and to struggle to prevent that violation of human rights that we're talking about against women, to make sure that the authorities, the personnel, agents involved, public entities, and all of the actors that act on behalf of public powers should behave according to this obligation. So let's think, for example, institutional violence to be able to approach other types of violence, for example, a single action or a repetition of actions that involve an institutional type of violence. Or it can also be, you can also carry out an action or an omission when you do not act, when you know about an imminent real danger or situation in which the sons and daughters who are the victims of gender-based violence are not taken care of or vicarious violence. Due diligence can commit the administration for not acting. As a new definition, we have the so-called sexual acceptance, a new definition in which we need to have the expressed will framed in sexual freedom and personal dignity. So this sexual consent must be present throughout the sexual practice, and it is limited to one person or to different people. So there must be consent to that person or to these persons, to a certain sexual practice, to a specific precautionary measure, both in front of a non-desired pregnancy or sexual, sexually transmitted infections. There is no consent if the aggressor creates conditions or takes advantage of a contact that directly or indirectly impose a sexual practice without counting on the woman's will. Another new definition that I shall develop in the protocol is the intersectionality or the intersection of oppressions. They are also part of gender-based violence. With the concurrence of gender-based violence with other axes of discrimination, which can be the origin, the skin color, the phenotype of the religion, the administration situation that women or children have, their age, social class, financial precariousness, the functional or psychological diversity, addictions, the serologic status, the lack of freedom, or the sexual diversity or gender violence that have in a differentiated that imply a differentiated impact. The interaction of these discriminations must be taken into account when it comes to approaching gender-based violence. As forms of violence that we all know about, we include new contents to violences that were already included in previous legislation. For example, psychological violence, it, we include violence in the woman's love environment, sons, daughters, and other family members. I'm saying that it's a threat or the cause for physical or psychological violence against the woman's affection environment, especially sons or daughters or, or family members who live with her or who have a direct relationship 
when it is used to damage the woman. We also talk about environmental violence. When there is violence exercised over the goods and properties of the woman with a financial or sentimental value or over animals with whom the woman has an emotional link in order to create an intimidation atmosphere against her. We also include contents to violences that had already been included. For example, in sexual violence, we include imposing a sexual practice. We include the bodily excess, genital mutilation, or the risk of suffering a genital mutilation, forced weddings, um, women's sexual harassment, exhibitionism, observation, and imposition of any sexual practice. With regards to financial violence, we include the unjustified and um, non-payment of um, alimony and the illegitimate appropriation of the goods belonging to the woman. And there are new forms of violence. We include now obstetri obstetrics violence and uh, the violation of sexual right and reproductive right. In other words, to avoid the access to information or her blocking access to a real information for autonomous and well-informed decision-making on the women's side. They, that may, may affect physical, psychological, or psychic health, including sexual and reproductive health. For example, about sexual preferences, about her reproduction, and the way to carry it out. We talk about forced sterilizations, forced pregnancies, not to allow abortion according to the legal accepted framework, difficulty to access contraceptive methods and methods to avoid sexually transmitted infections and HIV, and to avoid access to methods of assisted reproduction, and also gynecological and obstetric practices that do not respect the decision, the body, the health, and the emotional processes of women. As new forms of violence, we also have digital violence being suffered above all by young women, teenagers, violences through ICTs, networks, websites, fora, which damage psychologically or reinforce cliches. They harm the dignity. They are a threat against the freedom and they, uh, uh, they cause financial losses and they block their political participation and their freedom of speech. And they isolate young women who feel that they close up networks in order not to be subject subjected to violence. Second order violence, the one that is suffered by professional people who help victims. It is this phys physical or psychological violence, humiliations against women or people who give support to victims of gender-based violence, including the actions that hurdle the prevention, detection, and attention and recovery of women who are in a situation of gender-based violence. To talk about vicarious violence, the violence suffered by the sons and daughters in order to produce a psychological damage to the mother. In addition to the different forms of violence, we should also talk about the fields or the realms of violence, and they are changed as follows. In the realm of labor violence, we include discrimination due to pregnancy or motherhood. In the violence in the social or community field, we include in that realm the homicide of women, aggressions due to gender reasons, humiliations, disparaging treatments, threats, and coercions in public space. The restrictions due to individual expressions and collective expressions of women who claim the, for the respect of their rights and also public discourses that promote directly or indirectly discrimination or violence against women. 
the in, in the field of violence we talk about as a form of violence but we talk about the realm of violence digital violence the one that's produced in the network and as a field the so-called institutional violence actions or omissions by the authorities or the public personnel or agents of any public institution or body that has as a goal to delay, hurdle, or avoid access to those public policies that have been generated and to exercise the rights recognized by the law. So the lack of due diligence, both quantitative and qualitative, in the approach of gender violence, whether, whether it's known or promoted by the public administration, is a pattern of repeated and structural discrimination. And this is what we call institutional violence. And the use of the parental alienation syndrome is also a form of institutional violence, and it is recognized as such in Spain. And with regards to new fields of violence, we talk about violence in the field of political life and the public sphere of women. We also understand as institutional violence, if this violence is part of the public institutions and it is tolerated and not punished. And to talk also about violence in the educational field. Violence in the educa educational field is the one that occurs amongst the members of the educational community, amongst peers from a minor to a, from a from an adult to a minor or vice versa, which includes harassment, sexual abuse, physical, sexual, psychic or emotional harassment, and they are produced the ones that are produced by gender identity or gender. All of these measures have a goal to comply with the due diligence, the obligations related to prevention, care, protection, recovery, repair, and the punishment of, of, of gender-based violence and to guarantee the non-repetition of it, to recognize the right of women who suffer violence to all of these rights which have been defined by the law. And we need to assess every two years the whole network of care and recovery, integral recovery of women who suffer this male or this gender-based violence, and to establish and define mechanisms with an integral and well-coordinated intervention against this violence, and to create specific mechanisms to approach the, what we call second-order violence, i.e. the type of violence exercised against professional people who help the victims of gender violence through the cooperation of all of the Catalonian public administrations and with the participation of women association professionals and citizens organizations that act against this gender-based violence. And here we need to have some master principles that guide all of this law. These, what, what are these guiding principles in uh, the actions undertaken by the public powers. The active commitment to guarantee the protection of data, this is very important, the personal data of women, of women who are victims of gender violence, and also people involved and witnesses according to the applicable legislation. We should also guarantee the data protection, the personal data protection of the network professionals who work to protect these women in the recovery process to avoid secondary victimization and institutional violence against women and their children. We should also have compulsory and regular training with a gender perspective, with a childhood and diversity perspective by the professionals who care directly or indirectly of women in a gender-based violence situation in order to work on pre judgments, cliches, and a con continuous assessment of these supervision and professional recycling spaces. And in the public realm, there should be a specialization guaranteed. We should, we should also bear in mind 
that the different actions should be undertaken in a fluid way in order to make possible the right care and to avoid increasing the risk or the victimization with prompt and quick actions. The prohibition, is there a prohibition of mediation if the woman is has suffered or any form of gender-based violence in the field of the couple's relationship. We also have the right to effective protection. The approach of gender-based violence must try to suppress any psychological, legal, social, financial, and community factor that hurdles the formulation of the, uh, of the report against the gender-based violence by women. The assessment of the risk at the police station must be individual and adapted to the type of violence. And it should also include the risk suffered by the sons and daughters of the woman, not as it was the case till now, which was centered on, uh, in the case of the police, which in Catalonia are, in Catalonia are called Mossos. They were just focusing on the homicide of women. Now, there must be a subjective perception of the risk under, undergone by the woman. How has been the power relationship, the affection relationship, the emotional or financial dependency between uh, the woman and her aggressor, the time and type of violence, the family support, and the community support for the woman, the existence of legal procedures between both of them, and the existence of vulnerability factors and the empowerment of the woman. All of this is, an, is a part of the subjective perception of that woman the moment we carry out the police risk assessment. We have also carried out through this reform the obligation of calling at the police station before presenting a report to the lawyer's bar so that there is a lawyer that will come before reporting the case in order to help legally the woman who wants to report a gender-based violence situation. Now, the right to having a lawyer at the police station has been extended to all forms of gender-based violence, not only within the field of the couple. So we're talking about the family field and the work field. We distinguish that afterwards in order to go to the court in the same way that the cases of gender-based violence within the couple will be for free in other cases outside of the couple. It will have to be processed for free. It, it, it has not been perceived as something that has to be done for free. So we'll have to wait until we see whether she has the right to have a legal support for free or not. Here we have a problem of specialization. Because when you report work harassment, what type of a lawyer would be the best one? A, one specializing in violence or one specializing in labor law? And so we will need to develop the specialization of lawyers in the case of violence. As an effective protection, we have the obligation to create a risk assessment instrument to be used by forensic physicians and what we call integral forensic assessment units which are not very much used right now. In these forensic units, we need to have professional people specializing in the field of the family who are able to assess the risks for the minors in terms of the visits and custody. I mean, uh, an integral forensic service that goes beyond the physical or psychological damage generated in children, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In order to combat gender violence, we also need to include co-education and the sexual affective education to do an explicit, cross-sectional, rigorous and systemic approach from a gender perspective 
from uh, the early childhood or grammar school until the end of the compulsory education process. We need to guarantee the training with a gender perspective of all professors from the beginning of the training process. And this should be extended to all members of the education community. The government has a repair measure and within the current legal framework must guarantee the gratuity of the fees to be paid for the diplomas of students who can show their conditions as violence victims in the field of the couple and also their boys and girls or children. So far, this is guaranteed only for violent victims within the field, the couple field. The government must also promote efficient awareness raising strategies devoted to the group of elderly women so that they also know the resources and the strategies to face this violence against women so that they can adopt proactive positions in front of this violent situation. And for that, we need to ease the reach of this specific information about um, gender violence to these elderly women. From a public administration point of view, all public administrations must include the prohibition of any type of gender-based violence as a behavioral standard and to define punishment in their own disciplinary regime. We must have a protocol to approach male violence and we need to provide compulsory training in the field of gender equality and, and gender-based violence to their staff and people who have public elected posts or people who have been assigned a public post. So far, we have to talked about what the law says. And now I shall talk about the framework protocol that this law develops. If there are any questions about the law, please do not hesitate to ask. And if not, I shall carry on. So far, there are no questions, Maite, so you may carry on. Okay, let me carry on with the protocol. We'll start talking about how this law is developed through the framework protocol that has been developed by the Catalonian government. Okay, the first thing the protocol defines are the rights that give content to the fundamental rights that we all know. The rights that give content to this law end up being fundamental rights, which are the following ones. I'm going to mention them very quickly. If we talk about the violation of human rights and we get it down to gender violence or gender-based violence, we need to guarantee the right to protection, the right to an integral repair, the right to receiving integral care, the right to access justice, the right to be accompanied, the right to understand the information that's given to them, the right to accessing the services and resources that are made available to them, the right to confidentiality, the right to receive information about the legal and administration processes, to have a copy of the report, their sexual and reproduction rights, their independent decision-making the decision making right, the right to the prevention of different forms of gender-based violence, the right to the care and psychological assistance to children and teenagers who are in the situation of gender-based violence and to ask the exclusion from the custody of the aggressor parent. And if we go down even further to the women's rights, we have some specific rights for children and teenagers who live in situations of gender-based violence. First of all, the right to care and psychological attendance, assistance of children and teenagers in the situation of gender violence as soon as possible. The speed of the response is part of the rights and the due diligence I mentioned. At first, it was said that we did not need the consent of the parent against whom there was a court sentence in terms of violence. And if there were any signals of male or gender-based violence, but this has been developed even further. And now we are at a point in which we do not need the parents' 
the aggressor, the aggressor parent's consent if the mother has reported it and she has been taken care of in the network specializing in gender-based violence. So we are at a point in which a child may be taken care of in a network service if the mother is also being taken care of in these very same specific services without the consent of the supposed aggressor. In 16-year-old or older teenagers, their consent is the only one that can be demanded. They do not need the consent of their parents, and we need to guarantee slowly their progressive autonomy. The protocol defines and shows the different forms of violence. It develops what the law says, and I'm not going to read it out. I'm not going to repeat it again. In other words, the forms of violence that we have actually mentioned, physical violence, psychological violence, sexual violence, obstetrics violence, economic violence in the fields, the couple, the family, the work, social community, digital institutional, the political life, and the public sphere of women and the education field. And here we start talking about basic concepts that need to be developed in this protocol. And what does that mean? These are the bases that we have to bear in mind the moment we work in the field of violence. All professional people who start working in the repair of violence from an administration point of view, from the top all the way to the last technician, we have to actually frame our work here first. Due diligence. What are we talking about when we talk about due diligence? We need to comply efficiently with the obligation of preventing and repairing gender violence. It is crucial that institutions, services, and professional people from all of the sectors ask themselves at all moments what are the rights that are being violated, who and by whom, with the goal to produce consistent responses that avoid re-victimization and whose goal is to reach repair and prevention. Therefore, the due diligence means working from an ethical feminist positioning in all of our practices. And for that, we need to try and avoid institutional violence. Institutional violence, which can be produced at a primary level, or the re-victimization or secondary institutional violence. What is primary institutional violence? The primary one is the one that is produced without having a direct connection with the previous gender violence. For example, in cases of obstetrics violence or against their sexual or reproductive rights. In this case, primary victim victimization is institutional. We could give the following examples. To hurdle or to avoid access to legal abortion to the lack of knowledge or to violate the decisions taken by women and other people who are in the process of pregnancy, labor, or post-labor, not to investigate with due diligence sexual violence, not to detect sexual harassment for sexual or gender reasons, also for identity or gender expression in the education, health, police fields or in any other institutional field, not to train public administration staff in the field of gender violence. This is not directly a gender-based violence. It is not a previous gender violence, but this is primary violence against women who are suffering from this gender violence. Okay, we have gender violence. The secondary gender violence occurs when we work directly in the point of gender-based violence. The woman may have suffered primary violence, and we add with our way of working, we may re-victimize and we may be generating what we call secondary violence. So 
it could look like that institutional gender violence appears after a process of primary victimization, and then we talk about re-victimization or secondary victimization. For example, when we start working with a woman, we start doubting to start about the truth of the story of the sexual aggression suffered by a woman, a teenager, or child in the service. Or we assume that women who report gender violence do so in order to get some financial benefit or the custody of their children or to punish the man. You know, the, 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 the cliche of an instrumental woman uh, resentful woman, perverse woman. We're talking about 0.004% of real cases of that. And to bear that in mind could have an effect on the way we intervene in the case of women or not to believe or to disparage the ill feeling or the fear identified by women, children, or teenagers or to impose our own criteria on what that woman should do or what that child should do or what that teenager should do, or not to provide information that's accessible and sufficient to guarantee that the autonomy of the child or woman or in their decision-making process, or not to respect the time and processes of women, or to use consciously or unconsciously cliches or prejudgments based on national origin, status, migration status, age, ethnic group belonging, skin color, or disability, or gender identity, or the exercise of sexual work, the health condition, or addictions. If all of this has an effect on the way we will be working with that woman, we are victimizing, we are re-victimizing what that woman is already suffering as a victim of gender-based violence. And now we will talk about the so-called ecologic, ecological model. In order to understand in the right way the phenomenon of male or gender violence, we need to bear in mind that the violence cycle model does not take into account sufficiently the public or structural dimension of the problem. It minimizes the effect of social cultural macrostructures over which we build up interpersonal relationship when it gives most of the main character to the relationship between the aggressor and the victim what does that mean it means that if we only look at the fact that gender-based violence is a conflict or it is a situation between the an aggressor and a victim and we do not go beyond what has been generated by all of the cultural and social environment and what we all have as a cultural baggage, and we only concentrate on the micro situation in which, well, we will just remain at a micro level and we will not see the problem itself. This relationship between the aggressor and the victim resonates and has an effect beyond that individual violence. So that gaze focusing on the individual characteristics and on the couple relationship alone, oftentimes it has been accompanied by the trend to confuse risk factors with the causes of violence. If we only focus on the fact that gender violence is a problem between the aggressor and the victim as something very specific, then we end up confusing the causes, the root causes of violence with risk factors. And we may end up thinking that, for example, alcoholism, addictions or poverty are factors that act as myths or beliefs. And they, uh, they take up the function of minimizing the phenomenon and to make it invisible as a social phenomenon. And in no case, alcohol addiction or substance addictions or poverty are the root causes of gender-based violence. They may be a risk factor that increases it, but it will never be the root cause of the violence. In order to avoid this simplifying, these oversimplifying forms, and in order to explain this phenomenon of uh, a causal factor, it is better to adopt a multidimensional perspective and a circular perspective like the one proposed by this ecological model which was generated 
by Professor Bronfren Benna in 1987, over which the family rea re reality, the social reality, culture, is organized as a whole, as a comp compound system, a system composed by different subsystems that articulate between each other that are articulated between each other in a dynamic fashion. From the macro system, we have to go to the micro system, to the perversion of the system that reaches the situation of gender-based violence. Maite, listen, I wanted to uh, tell you, there is a question related to secondary violence, institutional violence. They say, when a woman, Nozika Castillo said, when a woman asks a specialized public system for help, why is she asked to report it to the police to get a shelter? Wouldn't that be considered as secondary violence? As far as I know, in order to go to a shelter, you do not need to report it previously. And if this is the case, of course, I would I would believe it is institutional secondary violence, yes. Okay. The need. And then I'll talk about shelters, okay? But I advise shelters. And you do not need to have a police report, at least in Catalonia, in order to be welcomed by a shelter. You do not need a previous police report. You get into a shelter depending on your risk situation, but it is not a requirement to having reported it at the police station. Then when they make an analysis of the woman's situation, sometimes they are, well, they are advised that maybe the better way would be to report it because maybe that could imply that they would be given an order of protection for themselves or for their children. But at least in shelters that I know and that I advise, it is not a requirement to have a previous police report. If this is the case, in my opinion, we are talking about revictimization. Of course. Fine. And we have another question from Marta Cremades. She says, what is understood by founded signs that there is male-based violence or gender violence so that actually they can actually be protected without the consent of the parent? Is there, if there is a criminal procedure without a court sentence, could that be a so-called well-founded sign? If not, could you explain that a bit more, Maite? Thank you. Well, this has evolved in time. Beforehand, if there was an open procedure, everyone understood that there were well-founded signs. When there was a report, even if there was no court, ruling, we have made headway. First of all, in the past, we needed to have a protection order or a firm court ruling. And if these were not the case, the children could not be taken care of. Then there had to be a report, an official report. And in this case, the child could be taken care of without the father's consent. And now we are at a point in which if the mother is being taken care of in a specialized service, and therefore, there is already an assessment of the fact that that woman is a victim of violence. The child can be taken care of without the father's consent, beyond the fact that there is an open case or not. That's a current situation, but it must be a specialized service, specializing in violence. Okay, I don't know whether I've clarified both questions with this. To me, it's quite clear, yes. Now, Zika Castello says, sure, they are not forced to, but they are pressured. Well, that will be dependent on the place where they find themselves in and every technician. Here, of course, this is part of this, of this protocol of how do we apply it and the way professional people have to work. 
the training of each professional person. That's why I believe that it's crucial that this protocol, and we are referring to Catalonia, but in all countries, protocols need to be worked out, not only at a macro level, but also at a level of, in, in terms of circuits, so that we go down to more local circuits and that we work with all professional staff and there is, well, you know, due diligence, no revictimization, the processes of women, the autonomous decision-making processes, and not to judicialize because oftentimes to judicialize it early implies a failure if the woman is not ready. If there are no sufficient signs, sometimes the basic function, in this case, my function as a legal expert is to see whether it's the right time, whether we have, whether we have the, the, the proof or not, and not to exert pressure. Because if the woman is not ready, the criminal case will fall and uh, will, it will fail. So it doesn't, it is no good to judicialize when it's not the right time. And we all know, those of us who are in this field, that institutional violence in the judiciary field is still very, very high. So we need to protect women before they get into the judiciary. Marta Cremades is saying something, isn't she? Carlota, can you hear me? Sorry, sorry, mighty. I was talking and my mic was silenced. Yes, Marta asked, she says, if a woman has been taken care of by a SIAD or a PIAD, but now it is considered that she doesn't need it anymore, would that be past care with its report sufficient for the children to be taken care of currently? No. Possibly, if the father generated conflict, he could have problems. With regards to this, I have to say we're missing jurisprudence. This protocol and this amendment of the law has not yet generated jurisprudence in the controversies of the patria potestad. This legal procedure, which is a voluntary jurisdiction that exists when there is conflict. Let's imagine, for example, something that uh, for which there has been an interpretation of what the law says, the, the article has been amended and it says that the child can be taken care of in a specialized service without the father's consent when the mother is being taken care of. So what happens if the father does not want to do it and the specialized service or the service still takes care of the child, the father could actually introduce a controversy of patria potestad. There is no jurisprudence with regards to what the judges decide. So we are still at the first phase of what we believe that the law says. We do not know what the court ruling will start saying with regards to these interpretations. We know what the law says and we will interpret it. And in uh, legal experts meetings, and this is being done, in the different fora and at the Catalonian government, we are interpreting it, but we do not have yet a firm court ruling that has been applied to controversies of patria potestad in which there are court rulings that generate jurisprudence. But in principle, it is something called, it's, so, the child should be taken care of. I mean, the fact that a woman is taken care of by a service currently, not in the past, and that affects the guardianship or custody controversy. 
Thank you, Maite. We may carry on. If there are further questions, I'll tell you. I think it would be good to change the ecological model and then we can have a coffee break, okay? So let's end with the ecological model and then we may carry on, okay? Or any questions that may come up. So, in this ecological model that I mentioned, we have the macro system, the exosystem. If you look at this diagram, this circular diagram, well, it's very small size, but you can see it, the mesosystem and the microsystem. We talk about the microsystem would be the individual level, okay? The macrosystem is the one that's most external, the, the cultural environment, the beliefs and cultural values with regards to what we have, women, men, what we believe with regards to men, women, families, children, teenagers, you know, the reference we have with regards to power and obedience, the attitude towards the use of power and force in the resolution of conflicts. That's something that's part of our culture and that we're impregnated with. The exosystem is a social environment. The institutional legitimation of violence or the violence allowed by the media, the secondary victimization, the lack of institutional support to the victims and impunity for violence perpetrators. And then we go to the microsystem. We have the violence that's conveyed by the media and what we convey at the family level, the family models we have, the regional family we all have, and the learning to, to solve conflicts violently. So what I've just told you, I mean, the model is inspired in other ecological perspective of the development of human behavior, which relates people with their environment and their atmosphere. So from that point of view, we could think that we must carry out actions at different levels, not only with regards to personal conflict, but also from a macro level, from the myths and cultural cliches that are used as a basis for violence and favor equality between men and women to raise awareness among the community about gender violence understood as a social problem and to involve it, to involve the whole of society in the search for solutions and to promote alternative models for the family functioning that's more democratic and less authoritarian and to have specific legislations in the field of gender violence and applied correctly. From the macro level, it implies changing culturally to what the micro level, and then to have the legal tools that we can have, but it is actually useless to have a lot of laws and we're at this point, we have a lot of laws if we do not change culturally society at large, because just using laws, we will not be able to change society. We change society with education and by working in the social realm, at the education, in the education field with children, etc. So if you'll agree, I could actually focus now on the feminist approach. Maybe we can stop here and have a coffee break. What do you think? Well, maybe we can have a coffee break now and we can come back, what, 20, in 20 minutes time? Okay, let's come back at 11.30, okay? Fine. So let's come back at 11.30. At half past 11 on the dot, we will see each other again. And then we will work for an additional hour until half past 12. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I believe we can restart. So following with the centrality model, the rights and needs of women, children and teenagers, we would also talk about the need of having a feminist approach in this protocol or intervention 
So what is this feminist approach? I believe that we are all clearer about it, but it is obvious that the feminist approach on the inequality or unequal distribution of powers and privilege because of sex, gender, or sexuality. These have systematically oppressed women based on the different male violences. So, feminisms have walked a long way to denormalize male violence to make them visible and to demand effective public policies for the eradication thereof so that women can enjoy recognized rights. So in order to understand how male violences operate, how to prevent them and how to repair them, this concept defines in a more general way a dominion, control, power abuse of men over women children, teenagers, and LGTBI plus people. And at the same time, it has impressed a hegemonic model that is still seen as bigger by some models in society. So the different ways male violence is shown are one of the worst in this culture, which not only destroys lives, but also prevents the development of developed autonomy of children and teenagers and people women and people in the lgtbi plus sphere this cannot be treated from a neutral perspective we rather need to take into account that this macho behavior continues to exist and that the transformation instruments must recognize this reality in order to eliminate the social inequality is generated by this misogynist violence so that this changes. And we're now talk about the need for an intersectional approach. What is this? Well, we can see it on this graph and I will explain further in the next slide. This is an intervention approach that brings to the table the different inequality, social inequality access, such as gender, race, ethnics, social class, sexual orientation, disability or age. They are all interrelated and are specific shapes and particularly shapes of inequality. So intersectionality also shows that the specific ways of violence are not the addition of all these axes I'm mentioning. It is rather set up in a specific way. So we need to look at the idea that women, children, and teenagers are not a homogeneous collective. So each specific policy or intervention affects differently depending on our social position, on our race, ethnicity, etc. All this is interrelated and we need to be aware of this and wonder what is the best way of organizing prevention and comprehensive repairing and all our intervention axes. Regarding the diversity of axes, it is essential that the inclusion of new axes is, does not rest importance to the others. So including an anti-racist perspective, um, for instance, does not make gender access less important. It rather helps understand it better because it allows us to understand relationships between capitalism, colonialism, and the patriarchal system. So recognizing transphobia as a shape of violence based on gender does not render male violence less important. It rather understands us to better understand how this gender binomial is generated. So it's not the addition of it all, it's rather to interrelate it all. Intersectionality is not synonym of diversity or a way of taking into account the different identities and people. It is rather a proposal to understand how structural inequalities affect specifically the different social groups and the change necessarily entails transforming these inequalities and including all these access in the intervention that we carry out with these women. 
Simultaneously, we need to also have a multidimensional approach in order to understand how male violences operate, how to prevent them and how to repair them. We must approach the restrictive framework in this theory we talked about regarding the macro system and ecosystem. We need to move from the restrictive framework and the particular conflict and understand that this is a political, social, economic and symbolic problematic and all the interventions related to male violences must be developed in balance in the different dimensions a political dimension and a technical dimension technically speaking will mean a comprehensive intervention that is respectful with privacy and with the rights of women children and teenagers and enough time must be devoted with a feminist approach and as well as an intersectional approach and guaranteeing non-victimization or re-victimization and at a political level we must have the necessary means for this adaptation in the social and community dimension we need to take into account to promote intervention in the social and community context of each women, child, and teenager getting in the entire society involved in the positive construction of society and reconstruction before male violences. This means, for instance, that in the case of feminicide or a high impact of the community, apart from the intervention with the abused woman, her closest environment must also be intervened. We are linking the ecologic model the intervention with a feminist concept, intersectionality, multidimensional approach, and the sectorial and intersectorial approach. It is necessary to plan intervention with the affected community, to go in deeper into the coordination spaces, the work, working as a network, but also, we must not forget this responsibility of working in a coordinated fashion and articulate this within each sector and have intersectorial protocols in each one of the departments, but also sectorial protocols are very important that can organize intervention within each professional sector, for instance, in the healthcare sector, um, women care, so each professional sector must also establish its own intervention protocol. And what is this intersectorial approach? Well, that would be the specific one for women care, social, health care, security, education, that is very essential. Also criminal execution within the judiciary, judiciary, occupational, cultural, and political and public administrations. These would be the essential ones. Finding others as well in the leisure one, for instance, as we're seeing and some more that will be generated. Working as a network as a guarantee for this intersectorial nature, this is a collaboration of two or more professionals who establish, based on the care and the needs, the identification of the rights abused in the case of women, children, or teenagers. But we, when we talk about working as a network, we're including interdisciplinary nature as an essential tool and this entails moving one step forward or beyond cooperation coordination refer refers to the agreements of cooperation between services and institutions based on existing programs i have an action program for instance and we do coordination but what we say is a multidisciplinary task or work, well, working as a network means knowing how to link the knowledge and having this become an ethical action by professionals and understanding that as professionals, we don't have the entire knowledge. 
and we must mobilize and recognize the knowledge of other professionals and services in the network not only of professionals, but also to recognize the knowledge of children, women, and teenagers we are actually taking care of. Recognizing others' knowledge and bringing it onto the table. This interdisciplinary nature is not the addition of all this knowledge. It entails something more. It is not to share information, spill it all over and just work with that. It is rather having reflections and disciplinary proposals in order to have other perspectives created by interrelated disciplines. And simultaneously, the participation and co-responsibility as an ethical demand. This entails understanding that women, teenagers, and children are not just individuals we are caring for. They are agents of knowledge, accepting that all responses are incomplete and provisional. So, and therefore, we must recognize the solution in itself so the macro solution does not exist, respecting everyone mutually as a foundation for acting. Trust between people. very important in this protocol that has been approved is the purpose of intervention. So placing the rights and needs of women, children, and teenagers at the center, this is a circular model where we see the axis of prevention and the axis of comprehensive reparation or repair. But there's also comprehensive repair and prevention. And within prevention, we would have individual prevention and structural prevention at the same time. And within repair, we would find repair for non-repetition, but then repair for recovery as well. And everything needs to stand there as a circle. And it needs to flow. So within the uh, framework, protocol framework, we have two things. It needs to be done in a circular fashion as a loop that intercrosses. When we work in repair, we're not only thinking about the recovery or the individual recovery of the affected person simultaneously or at the same time, we need to have strategies so that what has happened with that woman, child or teenager does not happen again. So this places us in a construction of a non-repetition guarantee and in a prevention access at the same time so that th that doesn't happen again. At the same time, when we work in the individual recovery, we start up strategies so that the situation of the woman, child or teenager does not become chronic and so that the risk does not increase. So this perspective of intervention is making us fo focus in repair and individual intervention. But when we make plans and policies for awareness, raising and intervention to generate cultural changes and institutional and social changes, so structural prevention, these are also fed by incidents and problems identified in specific situations. All this also has a repairing effect for women, children, and teenagers who are actually managing to leave male violence behind. So this is once again matched with repair. And intervention access, prevention and repair, the purpose for each intervention access establishes two big purposes. Prevention has a structural purpose and an individual purpose as well. Repair aims for non-repetition and recovery. And prevention has structural prevention as a goal. So prevention refers to the set of actions in order to reduce the incidence of the problem of male balance, reducing the risk factors, and I'm reading what you can see on the law, in order to prevent the normalization in the citizenship so that there's no way, um, it is no, in no way tolerable. So preventing is this, but then at the same time, we have the awareness raising process. 
in order for these male violences to become visible in all shapes and contexts presented so that structural causes are socially understood and so that this understanding generates new individual positioning so that they penetrate society and they generate individual and collective changes before specific violent situations this awareness raising must have an effect on cultural beliefs on collective imaginations and symbolic representations as well as social representations for all this to be possible dissemination as prevention tool is essential and we also must have a model that focuses on women, children, and teenagers in order to guarantee at all different intervention models that these, at the same time, know their own rights and the different mechanisms. Prevention is good for nothing if we're not talking about this awareness raising. At the same time, we need to research because this allows us to be more knowledgeable of the different contexts of male violence structural causes effective mechanisms for its elimination and co-education particularly effective and sexual education with a feminist approach the promotion of anti-male masculinities and community action are essential tools for prevention. And comprehensive repair, regarding comprehensive repair, we must take into account that this is a process that starts from detection itself. It is constituted by this set of legal, social work, healthcare, and educational measures adopted from all the different institutions and responsible bodies that are intervening in this male violence sphere that aim at guaranteeing recognized rights and to reestablish all damaged context without re-victimizing and guaranteeing non-repetition. So comprehensive repair is focused on centrality model in women, children, and adolescents, and works on all the different affected rights. Sometimes it's, it is not only about going back to the state prior to violence, which is a minimum goal. Of course, going back to the previous state, but the previous state or status could see an intersection of social vulnerations or violation. It is to fully guarantee the rights of people in this context and to promote social, individual, community, institutional rights so that male violence does not happen again. It is no good to go back to the prior state if the woman does not work and manages to repeat the model as many times as we've seen. So. We must stress that comprehensive repair goes beyond the different particular areas of the victim. It does not only have an effect on health care or sexual reproductive health care or economic compensation, workspaces, also in the community and in the institutions as an administrative and legal repair system. So we need to help them in all possible fields. Detection happens with technical and theoretical instruments in order to identify and make male violences visible, both if they appear sporadically or in a stable fashion, in order to know situations where to intervene in order to prevent development and chronicity. It is important to stress that this is not an initial or closed intervention state. I detect and that's over. It is a continuous practice between the different professionals, women, children, and adolescents in order to guarantee rights. And this requires a comprehensive perspective regarding shapes and contexts. The people who work in direct attention know that although children say that they've suffered some 
kind of violence in a specific environment, there's commonly more types of violence that they have suffered that have made being um, mean being invisible or hidden could have happened in the past or could be activated during the recovery process and it is essential to approach them all during intervention detection must be considered as something active throughout the entire recovery process because it allows us to organize accompaniment priorities to assess the different risks that may take place while you are performing recovery to provide a response to new needs and to guarantee those rights that have been violated or threatened all this is what we know as follow-up and update of detection throughout the process Finally, and also within the framework, I wanted to talk about the care of professionals, because this also means focusing on the rights and needs of professionals and workers who intervene in the care and intervention with women, children, and teenagers in these situations of male violences, because it is important to take care of the well-being of teams, and this is also included in the protocol. These professional teams that daily accompany women, children, and teenagers daily are exposed to high levels of wear and they can reach um, professional fatigue. So when we talk about care, we talk about the need for public policies that can recognize the value of feminist identities in their professionals who fight or have fought for many years against violence. And the protocol also includes this, and it includes different acts, actions that must be guaranteed, such as specialized training that is continuous and mandatory, working as a team and as a network, accompaniment programs for reflection and for personal care, prevention measures, and some comprehensive repair measures for professionals. And as I said before, the second order violence, which is to protect professionals who are working in this sphere. I would also like to make two comments regarding this. The protocol creates the crisis care service, which is a cycle, an immediate psychological care service in case of emergencies as a consequence of male violence that is also covering the professionals intervening. So this activation is not only specifically in cases of feminicide, but also in cases of serious situations so professionals can ask for them and the different territorial departments can also request them we must also state that this protocol is coordinated by the national coordination of the protocol and this is performed by the national committee in order to have a coordinated intervention against male violence and this is the maximum body of institutional coordination their role is to promote control and assess this approach of male violence and it is made up by a plenary a political plenary that meets twice a year there's three stable groups that are permanent there's one technical secretariat and some work groups based on territory they are temporary with a specific created with a specific goal which is to make this protocol reach all territories control its implementation so and make sure it is working in all possible destinations of male violence and we would now finally move to this part could we see the previous one yes this one we could now talk about this network attending and assisting women care so these are the different techniques that are used in the first and second level in emergencies how we work in catalonia regarding gender violence so here we would talk about three different levels the first level is we would see 
the police and the Mossos in Catalonia as legal police and a specialized body for victims of violence. This is a body made up by one or two professionals, normally women, but some men also intervene. And they have different roles within the Mossos. One of them is to care for those women who are victims of violence and who want to have a first degree counseling of their situation in order to capture the first risk indicators or receive advice. Because normally professionals and specialized services and lawyers or jurists are providing an assessment on the likelihood with all the evidence they have of what is the likelihood of this being good for a legal process or legal case and to have this first contact with the police in order to be receive counseling and so that they know them and have this first police force contact also victim care service if that women has um, any type of court ruling for protection that group will be doing that uh, follow-up of that ruling which could entail a restraining order for instance and they would see whether there's any problem with a the woman they call her or the phone they perform a risk assessment and depending on that, they call her in a more or less continuous way. As long as there's this protection order in place and different measures or actions for protecting that woman will be established. Local police, they also have a role in terms of victims of violence. This is a closer police and closer to the municipalities than Mossos. They have less roles in terms of um, gender violence or the judiciary, but they are closer. Uh, and GAV is not in all police stations. It is just part of Mossos, of the Catalan police. And this is expanding, but they have more and more roles because now, gender violence is not only within couples, but in all gender violence is outside of the couple as well. And now, with the new law of only yes is yes, we'll see whether there's an amendment to it or not. But the positive thing of this law, and there's many positive things to it, but sexual violence has now been made equal to gender violence and the roles of these victim care services uh, well follow up is follow up of the victim is done in a similar way as in gender violence victims and their rights are very similar so this follow up part is also followed by GAV in the social context, we would have social services, CAP. I will tell you what this is later on. On a second level, we would find SIE as a multidisciplinary service, and we would be the recovery services. And then as emergency services, we go back to the police because that is the service taking care of emergencies. And the residential services, which basically are shelter houses where women can go to if they are in risk situations and they are unknown. They can go to these shelter resources. There are three different types, but the emergency one would be a SAO, which is an emergency apartment or shelter house. There's also their PAS, which is um, an apartment where they can be in for midterm time. And then the shelter house would be more for the long term. 
Maite, Mariola was saying, I think you already answered this, but just in case, she was saying that the GAV services in all police stations sometimes uh, she she wants to know whether this is in all police stations because sometimes she's called and she's been denied the service yes this is what i said before because i saw the question no not in all police stations no not in all of them it is becoming more frequent uh, that you find it but it, you cannot find it in all of them perfect we can continue Okay, so here the plan basically is to explain you how knowledge works. There is this knowledge of the woman suffering from male violence. So what can happen regarding all the techniques we work on? So a woman victim of violence is detected. Who detects this? Well, this could be done from the healthcare sphere. They go to a healthcare service and um, whether there's an injury or not whether they make it verbal or not would be different maybe they've talked about it in an association in a woman association or in social services or with the police or in the healthcare sphere or in a school sometimes it is actually a child who talks about this so obviously the law i would make a differentiation here when it is a child reporting it or when it's a woman reporting it if it's a child in whatever sphere or context the obligation is to tell the prosecution or the police authorities so if a child talks about ill treatment prosecution must know of it in terms of women we're talking about of age women and her will this is slightly delicate but if there's no serious injury and here we would be talking about a delicate topic or a sensitive topic but where the will of the woman is taken into account so depending on where she goes if she goes to a healthcare service and she shows an injury she has an injury healthcare services are forced to report um, the court and whether she reports it or not that is something subsequent and despite her refusal to actually go to court that could move forward we will see whether legally speaking if um the court wants to bring the case forward and the woman doesn't want to testify we'll see what that takes but the healthcare service is forced to tell the court social services well social services are frequently coordinated with schools so if a child speaks at school about this and social services is connected to the school they can also know about it if the woman goes to the police or most of the squadra of the Catalan police and says anything that would be another way of knowing or reporting in the Catalan police it is also important to know that well this is a police body and depending on what the woman says or shows as evidence they could act depending on what she says or showing as proof or evidence the police could act ex officio act publicly and well if there is um injury or not so if there is injury uh, the healthcare services might pass it on to court or the police may act publicly. So if she wants to report, then this can be done through the police and the woman can request a protection order. Protection order means that the judge will subsequently assess in a maximum 72 hours two things if there is 
a sign of offense or if there is a risk situation. Objective risk situation means not that the woman is anxious or feeling anxious because of what has happened, but rather following a risk assessment, it is understood that there is uh, given the offense reported with the uh, history of the man and the factual situation of the woman and all the context surrounding the woman, that woman needs to be protected. And that protection could be done through restraining order, prevention of communication, etc. So if there is a protection order allocated, then that woman well, that order protection may entail that the attacker has a cautionary measure against him, stated against him, there's a restraining order, prohibition of communication, or both, and some other actions as well, but these two are the most frequent ones. I'm seeing that there's things in the chat, but I can't actually read them. I'm going to tell you, Graciela says that as of the 1st of March, the SAV service in the Urban Police of Barcelona uh, will start. This means that they'll be able to manage uh, reports of women suffering from male violence. This is a new protocol in order to extend coordination between the different um, police bodies and to improve the care of women suffering from male violence. And for the first time, urban police will be able to directly process reports related to this type of cases, which could only be processed through Mossos de Squadra or the Catalan police. This will take place in Novaris and another district and Ciudad Bella as well. Oh, OK, perfect. I am part of the regional scope, so I didn't know about Barcelona, but I think it's very important because the local police is closer. So we hope this can be extended to further contexts beyond Barcelona. OK, let's continue. Thank you. So we'll continue with the plan yes with the with, with the diagram so this is in terms of protection so there's this protection order legal protection order and regardless of this this is a cautionary measure that will entail an open legal case this legal case will be a criminal case if there's children involved and a protection order is ruled some civil measures stemming from this protection order must be established. In a civil way, this has been amended, and what is now established is that if there is an open criminal case of gender violence related to a parent or a father, the visit regime will be immediately suspended with that parent. We, there's much more content, and this would be an entirely different speech, but possibly here we would have civil measures stemming from this protection order, and possibly there would be a provisional visiting arrangement interruption, and the full custody would go for the, or guardianship would go to the mum, and this would be provisional with a maximum duration of 30 days because we are in the criminal sphere. So the lawyer, particular lawyer for the woman, should present in the maximum term of 30 days a report, a civil report, which will also be in case of the criminal and the civil um, uh, lawsuit, so that this reaches the court regarding the criminal measures of the attacker, depending on the offense, this could only be not not only be the protection order, but depending on the offense, we could be talking about a provisional prison or this protection order or restraining order, or maybe it is a mild offense, or maybe a, the case is just filed. All this happens if the offense is reported. If it is not reported, well, as we were saying, it is not necessary for a woman to report the offense or the attack. 
we will not talk about the SIAD or SIE. A woman stating she's a victim of violence can be cared for by any service in the network. As we've said before, if she is in a vulnerable situation regarding or having to live with the attacker because she's been denied the protection order or she is afraid to report, but she has nowhere to go to, she can go to a shelter house if there's free spots, of course, because that sometimes is difficult without the need to report. Okay, so as we were saying, these shelter homes, there's three types. There's the emergency ones, the short stay ones and the shelter homes. The three shelter services are aimed at women and their children suffering any type of male violence in the context of the couple, family, social or community with sexual attack, sexual exploitation of female uh, genital mutilation, their specialized free services, and the difference is the stay, the duration of the stay, as well as the duration of the stay of professionals, whether they're permanent or non-permanent. They have the purpose of providing this urgent response and first care for women and their children. They must offer a shelter space and guarantee the security, personal security of the people they're caring for. They are 24 seven and the type of stay could not exceed 15 days. This has been varied but that's how it is now. This must activate all the different resources for women and children, all the services they need. So the main roles or functions are to offer this personal security space, emotional contention space, guaranteeing uh, physical security and integrity, to offer personal and social resources in order to solve the crisis situation generated in the case of a woman that has to leave her house overnight mm. and whatever situation she has experienced to prepare the service, provide counseling, to offer the shelter space that allows for reflection, for a decision-making process, and to work in coordination with all other services and with the comprehensive network of male violence and with the corresponding referrals. So the first legal counseling, for instance, obviously, if you have children, some legal steps must be taken and some things must be communicated, offering coverage of basic shelter needs, food and health care during her stay or their stay in the case of women with children. So there's a question here. Can children report um, gender violence or male violence if when they reach the coming of age? But also, yes, yes, they can. But when there's injury, women uh, with injuries going to the police or psychological violence, and that needs to be reported. Well, that obviously police can never refuse or deny us the right of report whatever we want. The police needs to collect the report of whatever the person wants, but they could counsel that if there's no evidence, nothing can happen. But they can actually, can't actually reject or dispute that you want to report. They may request evidence through WhatsApp, for instance, or witnesses who have um, seen how controlled you are because you've received, I don't know how, how many control calls through audio messages. That psychological violence must be somehow proven 
or evidenced. Otherwise, that will very likely not move forward, but it is established in the Catalan law, in the criminal code. There are rulings of psychological violence. So if medical files and reports can be presented with symptoms compatible with a woman that has been a victim of gender violence without having lesions or injury. Oftentimes, psychological violence is worse or could be worse than physical violence. Physical violence is reportable and condemnable, but the difficult here is the evidence, of course, but this violence. Well, we try. We need to try and find as much evidence as we can in whatever shape and form and means that we can. But obviously, yes. Okay, Maite, let's continue. So the next one. Other shelter services would have the same characteristics, but there would be some difference in the apartments with support, for instance, with services that have to replace the house or the home. Several single parents' families may live there and they work on their recovery after violence with the support of professionals. What changes here is the term of stay and the fact that professionals are not there in that apartment for 24 hours or 24 seven, they come and go and there's more autonomy by women and children. However, shelter homes are for long term stays with professionals who are there for 24 hours or 24 seven and they could be there for six months with an extension of a further six months. Entire families live there for the entire recovery process. And it is an entirely different profile. This is a long term recovery. And the process is long with an intense work and task done with women and the children. On some previous time, there was a psychologist and a lawyer there as well. And currently, the lawyer is provided by the SIE. So let's put, I am the jurist, for instance, in some apartments and with support and some shelter homes as well. So legal counseling is outsourced from the SIEs and within the shelter house and the support apartments, they do have counseling by a psychologist, but it is a psychologist helping in the day-to-day -day recovery, but if they need a further um, psychological recovery, they need an additional service. And SIADs are part of the first line. They're public services of the municipality or the region. They are for free, multidisciplinary and confidential. They are more general services, providing information and care for women. They offer information, counseling, first level of care and accompaniment in the defense of rights of women in the work, social, personal, and family environment. They do put stress on situations of male violence, and they work on awareness raising in the community in the favor of effective equality between women, uh, women and men. They work and collaborate with other centers and services. They have groups of women, and they work with the association fabric of the territory. The main roles are to inform affected women, professionals about rights and resources, documents. They provide care for, they counsel and inform on specific resources and situations of discrimination and in situations of male violence on different social healthcare, work, training and grants. 
scenarios. And in cases of gender violence, they carry out the first interventions in terms of detection, and there is legal and psychological counseling as well so that women can identify their own violent situations. And now there's interventions for minors as well. And from CIADS, there's the first detection performed, and if they see that there is a recovery uh, process needed for the long term, they perform the referral to SIAs. And finally, we reach SIEs, the, specialized, the, survey, the service that is specialized in male violence. SIEs, if we talked about the healthcare system, we would be talking about um, primary attention center. So let's th think about this as an SIE and a hospital, a SIAD, sorry, and a hospital would be an SIE. So in order to work on the chronicity of an illness, or I, I wouldn't really talk about hospitals, but out of hospital, the recovery of all that would also be in uh, responsibility of an SIE. We have comprehensive care in the process of recovery for women and their children, those who have suffered or are still suffering from male or gender violence, support counseling and training of professionals and services involved. And we also have an awareness raising service and prevention of male violence in the community. How do we do this? Well, the structure of professionals is as follows. We have management, administration, and in women care, we have three psychologists, one jurist, one social worker, and one social educator. In childcare, we have one child psychologist and one social educator. This is a multidisciplinary team, and we work as follows. When a woman arrives, and she can come directly. This is less common, and we normally receive them by referral. So they could come from the Kellan police or the local police, or from social services. We have said that the first line was referral from social services or from a mental health center where they've seen a very serious effect on a woman, but they see that the foundation of it all or the basis of it all is um, gender violence or a CEDIAC, a center caring for a minor, a child, but they see that the true problem is a male violence problem of the mom or a CIAD that is um, performing the referral for long-term service. So this is managed by a social educator and a social worker. So there's this welcoming phase is done by them unless there's a legal um, thing that must be covered, then uh, this can be done by the jurist. So after that, the social worker will perform an individual improvement plan in order to establish the work plan in the CA or SIE with a woman. And from then on, an intervention plan will be prepared, a valuation plan will be performed as well. And this could entail several sessions of the professional with a woman. And then the intervention plan will be established. So the different specific actions with a woman. This could be a legal, psychological, social, educational plan, or all of them. They could be interrelated. So coordination between all the different professionals is essential here. That is why we say we are a multidisciplinary team. We meet up to talk about the different cases and to prepare the plans. Of course, this must be flowing constantly, seeing what is happening with that woman and assessing the situation in a constant fashion. At the end of the process, there is no term or time. Uh, women can have intervention for years in the SIEs, but there is a closure at the end. And even after closure, there could be a post-closure 
intervention because the woman comes back and sometimes they do come back with a new attacker because the process was not properly closed or recovered that can happen or promptly because there's um, well something else going on So Avery talked about what SIE offers, legal counseling, accompaniment for families. There's also groups. We didn't do them with COVID, but now we are having groups of women once again with psychological therapy and not only psychological accompaniment that is individual, but therapeutic groups actually we found work very well. Come comprehensive recovery of children as well, participation in municipal events, talks, prevention and awareness raising through workshops and conferences, and training of professionals or individual counseling and supervision of circuits. We are also supervised by professionals. And this is my intervention. So anything I can help you with or any question I can answer, I'm here for that. Maite Mariola is asking, how can we refer women to you? Can you please facilitate contact details? What I'll do is to send the email, um, I don't know, maybe through you or well, I'll send you my email and the referral sheet. So, Maite, yes. When we have the assessment questionnaire sent out by Maria, we can maybe add this referral sheet in the email. What do you think? Yes, perfect. That would be perfect. Fine, perfect. So there's no more questions. Thank you very much, Maite, and thank you very much, everyone, who've been here throughout the entire training. I'm sure we will see some of you again on Thursday. We will have our colleague, Carol, um, with the multi-family approach training. And thank you very much. That is all. Thank you. Thank you to the translators as well. They are here. We can't see them, but they're here. And um, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here replacing my colleague. And um, thank you all for everything. Thanks, my day. It's been super interesting.